The day was Friday, December 15th, 1995. As I remember it, it was early afternoon. I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, walking home from my last class, a course on the Old Testament, before driving to my home state of Pennsylvania for winter recess. There was a decided spring in my steps as Vanessa was in Pennsylvania caring for our firstborn son. I had made the trek from Cambridge to Harrisburg every weekend of my first semester in divinity school. But this time I could stay for a while for winter recess. As I gathered my belongings at my apartment for the trip, I heard the details on the news of a very grim weather forecast. A nor'easter was headed for New England, bringing with it the usual Arctic air mass and significant snowfall. I struck out for Pennsylvania as quickly as I could in hopes of getting ahead of the worst part of the storm. When I left the apartment building, I ran into my neighbor, Mr. Fermondi, who tried to convince me to wait out the storm and leave for Pennsylvania in the morning. But I was determined not to let a 400 mile journey in Arctic temperatures and blizzard conditions keep me from seeing Sister Vanessa. Somebody say amen. amen. I wrote that for you, Vanessa. <laughs> As I drove across the Massachusetts Turnpike, the snowfall that had been forecasted began. By the time I reached Interstate 84 in Connecticut, the snowfall was significantly heavier. Eventually, I made it to the state of New York in still worsening conditions. In the state of New York, there is an interchange for I-287 and I-84. I-287 takes you through the Hudson River Valley across the Tappan Zee Bridge. I-84 takes you into the mountainous region of north central Pennsylvania. I made the decision to continue on I-84 to avoid the New York City traffic. And as I turned into the left lane, uh, continuing on I-84, my car began to slide out of control. I don't know if this has ever happened to you before. And it didn't matter whether or not I had my hands on the steering wheel, uh, my car was just kind of doing what it wanted to do. When finally my car came to a stop, I was in the median strip in several inches of snow. After I pulled myself together somewhat, I got out of the car and checked to see if the car was damaged. I was still a young driver and I had never been in that situation before, standing in the median strip somewhere in the state of New York at night in the middle of a treacherous blizzard. Can you see the picture? As I labored to bring things together, I looked up and I saw a man who had pulled over to the side of the road. And he was running across three lanes of traffic toward me. And he asked me, he said, uh, are you okay? And I answered, yes, I was okay. Then he asked me if I could drive my car. These are things that I wasn't thinking about at that time. Is your car drivable? And what the unnamed man did was he helped to center me. He helped me to keep it together because I could not afford to lose it in that particular situation. Indeed, he, he showed me an act of kindness that was rare even in the year 1995. And he took a risk to do so. I'm not gonna be before you long today, but I want to give you three good reasons why everybody should be kind. Three good reasons why everybody should be kind. Now, as I, re as I rehearsed that story to you, I could actually see it, it was so vivid. 1995 is a long time ago, but I could see, I could actually see the man. I remember he had an Audi, and he pulled over and he turned on his four ways and he was coming through. See, I think we, there's something about acts of kindness that are really, they are memorable. We, we can remember them. When somebody kind of moves out of their position, out of their lane, and takes a risk to help us, and they don't have to, he could have drove by me like everybody else was driving past me. But he actually stopped and took a risk, and I'll, I'll never forget it. I want, I want to just, I, want, I, I, can, I imagine I could give you more reasons, but I just want to give you three today. Maybe we'll give you some more on next Sunday. But three reasons why everybody should be kind. The first reason that you should be kind is because somebody was kind to you. Somebody was kind to you. 
I know when we're feeling down, when we feel as though, when we're feeling down, we have a tendency to feel like no one cares. No one loves us. No one is kind to us, especially when we're feeling down. But the reality is, if we were not the recipients of others' kindness, we would not be here today. One Bible dictionary defines kindness as goodness in action, sweetness of disposition, gentleness in dealing with others, benevolence, affability. The word kindness speaks in some instances to the ability to act for the welfare of those taxing your patience. We're going to go here this morning. The ability to act for the welfare of those taxing, taxing your patience. Now, I know many of us, we know that it's, it's easier to be kind to people who are kind to us. That's an easy one. It's really not that hard for me to be kind to my family, to my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brothers, to people uh, that I know very well that I grew up with. But sometimes we have to be kind to people who tax our patience. And this is where kindness can be challenging. This is, this is where, this takes us into the realm of kindness as a fruit of the spirit. Not dictionary definition kindness. Kindness as fruit of the spirit. Biblical kindness, yeah? And so when we say kindness is a fruit of the spirit, what we're saying is that the only way that you can exhibit this kind of kindness is that if the spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit gives you the capacity to be kind to someone who's taxing your patience. The Holy Spirit is the fruit that is born in the life of a person, and born in the life of a person. That kindness comes out of a person who has the Holy Spirit in them. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Kindness, somebody says, is when your child, though treated badly by a friend, shares gummy bears with her friend at snack time. That's kindness. Kindness is when you, though frustrated by your child's poor choices, choose not to react in anger. It's an unnatural act that comes supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. Did you get it? Let me say it again. It's an unnatural act that comes supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And while you in and of yourself may find it difficult to be kind, the Holy Spirit empowers you to be kind. Kindness is the fruit that grows in the lives of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the, Holy, the same Holy Spirit removes the abrasive qualities from the character of one under the Spirit's control. The Apostle Paul writes about the need for Christians to be kind in his letter to the Ephesians, and I'm going to read for you what he wrote. The Apostle says this, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's a mouthful. It's a mouthful, particularly in a day where uh, mean-spiritedness is so alive. Yes. It's everywhere you turn. You, you try to get away from it. You turn off the TV. You, you look on your, your iPad and you, or you read the newspaper and there it is again on the front page. It's almost as if now we celebrate mean-spiritedness. The meaner it is, the more we want to print it. Is that that's just the day that we're living in. So the Apostle Paul's word here about kindness is very important. Because of the, the distinguishing characteristic of those who are in God are those who know how to be kind, even in a mean day. See, the thing is, it's, not, it's no excuse for us to be mean just because everybody else is mean. If the Holy Ghost is in you, you have the capacity to be kind. Do you believe in church? 
He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The Apostle Paul's teaching leads us to our second point. That is the second good reason that we should be kind. We ought to be kind because God was and is kind to us. Do you believe in church? If you're ever struggling with being kind, just, just remember, just remember the, the depth of God's kindness toward us. Amen. To the person who is testing your patience, just remember, just remember the length that God was willing to, to go in order to be kind to you and me. It, it's, it's an awesome thing when we think about it. We, sometimes we have to unpack the story to realize what God did for us. And at the end of the day, listen to me. At the end of the day, God sent God's own beloved son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And I, I know that we say it's bad out there now, but it was bad 2,000 years ago, too. People were mean 2,000 years ago. Look what they did to Jesus, yes? Crucifixion, yes? People were mean then. And God, God sent his own beloved son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. An earth that he knew had mean people in it. A, a earth that he knew had hateful people in it. A earth that he knew had people that would lie and conspire to undo you. He still sent, he still sent. And not just, I wish I could say it's, I wish I could say it's just worldly people, but, but it was the religious establishment that conspired to put Jesus on the cross. It was church folk. And yet God still sent his son Jesus to this earth. It is, it is, the, it is the greatest act of kindness. It is the greatest act of kindness. And, and, and even more, even more, Jesus is in heaven. Listen to me. In heaven, we can't even imagine the bliss that is heaven. It is a place that we would not want to leave. And yet Jesus agreed to come down to take on the form of a slave. The Bible says a bond servant. He, in, in fact, he, he robed himself in a garment of humanity. Are you listening to what he did? He's Jesus is in heaven. He has everything. He's sovereign. He's in heaven. There's no sickness. There's no death. There's no pain. There's no hardship. There's no mean spiritedness. He's in heaven, and yet he, he agrees. It's, it's, a, it's an act of kindness, church. It's, and the thing is, he did it for me, and he did it for you. We didn't deserve such a supreme act of kindness, and yet at the right time, God did it just for us. So when you think about the person who is testing your patience, think about what God did for you and me. Yes. And at the right time, Jesus Christ, he came down to this mean earth, this, this place that we call earth. That, is, that when God got done creating it, he saw that it was very good in Genesis chapter 1. And by Genesis chapter 6, God was ready to destroy everything. That earth. And yet God sent his own son to this earth. So that, we, so that he could fill us with, with his spirit and empower us to live lives just like Jesus. It's an act of kindness, church. And I want you, before you leave, I want you to get it in your mind. I want you to, I want you to get the persons or the, the people in your mind that are testing your, your patience. And I, I want you to remember what we're saying to you today. And I want you to rehearse the fact that God has already given you God's spirit. And, and the fruit of the spirit is Kindness, which means that you have the capacity to be kind to even that person. Yes. And the thing is that I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me go back. Let me go back. Be kind because God was and is kind to you. Are you hearing me, church? Now, Paul highlights the justification for our kindness in his letter to Titus. Here are Paul's words in the message version. This is, this is Eugene Peterson's the message version. I'm going to, I read this for you uh, in our scripture reading, but I'm going to give it to you in a different version. I want you to listen very carefully. It wasn't long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, Hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior, stepped in, he saved us from all that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath, and we came out of it new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously 
God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us, given us back our lives. And there's more life to come. An eternity of life. You can count on this. That's what God did for us. That's what he did for us. He, he cleaned us up and he gave us the capacity to love and to forgive and to be kind. At the end of the day, my friends, the kindness we show has eternal consequences. This is where I want to leave you today. If you're being challenged in terms of being kind, I want you to remember that the kindness that you show in this world has eternal consequences. In Paul's words, God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come, an eternity of life. Listen to me very carefully. I've been reading the Bible since I was a young boy. And in my young adult years, I made a decision to go to divinity school to learn even more about the Bible. I'm still a voracious reader of scripture. And one of the things that I'm convinced of through my reading of scripture is that there are no mean people in heaven. I read it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there, the, the mean people, they're, they're, I can't find one mean person in heaven. Are you listening to me, church? I'm, I'm utterly, I'm utterly convinced. And if you're looking for a mean spirited, hateful, unkind people, heaven is not the place that you're going to find them. Ages ago, listen to me, the Bible says that all the mean folk, all of the unkind folk, all of the folk that, that set themselves against the sovereignty and will of God, the divisive folk, were kicked out of heaven. This is what the Bible says. Read Revelation chapter 12 when you get home and you'll find the account of, of the heavenly ousting of the devil and his minions. It's all there, church. In my Bible, the account recorded in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 12, has a brief heading that reads this. Satan thrown out of heaven. <laughs> the scripture reads, it goes this way. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. If you want to know why people are so mean in the world, read chapter, Revelation chapter 12. It's right there. The point here is that the devil is not going to heaven. Are you listening to me? He has already been cast out of heaven. Now, now his assignment is to keep you out of heaven. Listen to me very carefully. Listen, don't, don't miss it because of this. That's his assignment is to keep you out. And if he can keep you out by keeping you uh, bitter and angry and hateful and mean-spirited and unforgiving, if that's, if that's what he can do, then, then he, he succeeds. Are you listening to me, church? He's not going, but we've got to make it up in our, in our minds that we're going, we're going to get there somehow, some way. I'm, going, I'm making it to heaven. And, and if, I've got to, if I've got to eat the fruit of the Spirit every single day to be kind and to be gentle and to be loving and to be forgiving, but that's just what I've got to eat for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. That's just the way I've got to live. Are you with me, church? Kind people go to heaven. I'm going to prove this point to you, and then I'm going to take my seat. In the book of Acts, we encounter a woman who lived her life in a manner which we could describe as heaven-bound. That's the type of life that we need to be living, heaven-bound lives, yes? There's a woman in, in, in the book of Acts, and, and the Bible said her name was Tabitha. Do you know the story? She was also called Dorcas, and the Bible says this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Are you, are you listening to me, church? But it happened in those days that Tabitha became sick, and she died. It happens to us all. And when, and when they had washed her, they laid her body in an upper room. Seeing that Tabitha had died, there, some of her closest friends, they sent for Peter. Oh my gosh, they sent, they sent for the man of God and, and they implored him not to delay in coming to them. So Peter, the Bible says, he, he got up and he went with them. And when he came, he, he, he brought, they brought him to the upper room. And Tabitha, Tabitha was, she was a special person. I mean, she was so special. She was so charitable. She was so kind that people were actually mourning when Peter got there. 
She, she made these tunics. My God, she made tunics in her life. She made tunics. And, and, and the Bible says that they were mourning and they were, they were sitting around her body and they were clutching and they were holding on to the, to the garments that she had made in her life. And they were mourning the fact that she had passed because she was so kind. The one thing that people are going to remember about you is how kind you were. When you're long gone, listen to me, it's your kindness that people will remember. Now, I'm saying this having done I don't know how many funeral services. I've done funeral services after funeral services, funeral services. For 20 years, I've been doing funeral services. And I can always tell when the person was kind. And I'm not talking about the people who get up and say all of these things. I'm talking about who shows up. I'm talking about who shows up in the spirit, the spirit of generosity that in the, and love that is in the room because that person lived a kind life and people are, are they're sorry because the kindness that that person showed is no longer available to them. They were mourning, they were clutching the garments that she had made. And, and the disciple of Jesus Christ named Peter, listen to me, listen, listen, listen at what happens, listen at what happens in the story. It says that, that all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all out of the room and he knelt down and he prayed. And this is what he did. He turned to Tabitha, who was dead. Tabitha, who had already died. And he said two words. Tabitha, arise. And the Bible says she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up. When she saw Peter, she sat up. Listen to me. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and he called the saints and with saints together, he presented her alive. He said, what is, I mean, what does that have to do with living a kind life? I think the point, at least to me, is clear. Listen to me, church. When we live kind lives, you know what? You know what is waiting for us? It's called resurrection. It is not about you being raised to new life to come back to Owings Mills. That's not what I'm talking about. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the writer of scripture is pointing us in the direction of living a kind life leads to resurrection. Living a kind life leads to that life that is eternal. Yes, living, living a kind life leads to living a life that is eternal in, in, in happiness and unity with God who made us and created us for acts of kindness. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I want you to take this home with you today. Then listen to me. Whatever, whatever was done back in the day is not enough for you to be, to be weighed down with mean-spiritedness and hate, hating one another. Listen. It's not, it's not worth it. What I found out, what I found out is that, is that when people offend you, people very often, they offend you and they, they're, they're living their lives. In fact, you may, you may try to talk to them about how they offended you back in 95 and they won't even remember. They won't even remember it. And you still weighed down with all of the stuff that they did to you back in 1995 and they moved on with their lives and you just, you know who it's affecting? It's affecting you. It's affecting you. And listen to me, this is what the Holy Spirit does to us. The Holy Spirit, the one of the things that the Holy Spirit, you know what, it, it heals us. And what I want you to do, whoever I'm talking to today, I, when you go home, I want you, I want you to get down on your knees and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to heal you because we're not minimizing hurt. People can hurt you. We're not going to minimize the pain that you've gone through. We're not going to do that. We're going to acknowledge it. But what we want you, what we want you to know today is that the Holy, the Holy Spirit has the power to heal you and to give you the capacity to be kind. Yes. When you go home, I want you to get down on your knees and I want you to say, God, listen, Holy Ghost, God, I want you to heal me. I've tried everything. I've, I've, gone, I've gone to the therapist and I've, I've been to counselors and I, and I tried to talk to the person and I tried to do this and I tried reconciliation. I tried everything and nothing, nothing worked. I'm still weighed down. On them. You get down on your knees and you say, God, I need you to heal me. Now, now here's the thing. Here's the thing about God. God can do it. Yes. God can heal. God, God can heal. There's no hurt that God cannot heal. There is no pain that God cannot, there's no sickness, there's no disease that God cannot cure. And sometimes the worst thing that we're dealing with is the pain of what somebody had done to us. Yes, let's just own it. Yes. 
The cancer that is eating away at us sometimes is what somebody did to us. But my, my, my challenge to you today is to give God a chance. And what God will do, God, God, because you know why? You know why God will do this? Because God wants you to make it to heaven. God wants you to make it. He wants you to make it. He wants you to make it. And I want you to ask God, God heal me. Heal me and give me the capacity to love like God loves. Give me the capacity, that, 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 an inkling of the capacity that Jesus had when he was on the cross bleeding and dying and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. God, I need that. I need that. And God will give it to you. God will give you the capacity to be kind. God will give you the, be, the capacity to be generous, to love, uh, to do everything that you need to be to be a model disciple. To be a model disciple in Christ's name. Now, the world needs, I'm finished, but the world needs, you know what the world needs? The world needs kind people now. The world needs kind, kind people on our jobs, kind people in our families, kind people in the schools, kind people in the hospitals, and then kind people the world needs kind people and if the world doesn't get if we're not if our churches aren't sending kind people into the world where they gonna come from church we need to send kind people into the world with a message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ amen amen, amen. I'm gonna pray for you now I'm going to pray. You can stay right where you are. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the person. Well, no. We're going to let you come to the altar. If you want to come to the altar, and we'll, we'll leave. We'll dismiss from the altar. If you want to come to the altar, and because you, you want to grow in, in the capacity to be kind. Now, don't feel ashamed about it because if we're honest about it, all of us can grow there. But if you want to grow in the capacity to be kind, if you, if you want God to deal with that stuff that, that is in the way of you, that is in the way, that is blocking you, that is hindering you from, from being generous and kind, we want you to come to the altar because ultimately we believe it's a work of the Holy Spirit that God has to treat it. Yes, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. So we want you to come forward right now in Christ's name. And we're just going to pray. And we're going to ask God, this is what we're going to ask God. We're going to ask God to do it today. Not, not after Thanksgiving. See, because your Thanksgiving is not going to be the Thanksgiving it should be if you carry it. The turkey is not going to taste the same. The gravy is not going. It's not going to have. It's not going to have the effect. We we don't. Not, not after Christmas. Not after Christmas. We want God to do it today. Today. That's our prayer. And that person had just come to the altar in Christ's name. I'm with you at the altar today. In Christ's name.